Yeah, yeah, sure, I want to hear a joke, yeah. Why can't the Allies retake Rhodes? Um, I don't know. Why can't the Allies retake Rhodes? Cause. Cause what? That's the answer. I don't get it. October 8th, 1943. You've been driven out of a city, a major city, but you can still hurt the enemy there, even for weeks after you've gone. All you need is a healthy dose of hidden explosives. Did I say hurt the enemy? I meant terrorize the local civilian population. Those two sometimes get confused. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese began evacuating their garrison on Kolombangara, though they still have men on nearby Vela La Vela. The Axis were also evacuating from the Kuban and doing so under Soviet fire. The Soviets had a great week in general, liberating both Smolensk and Roslavl, and creating a whole bunch of bridgeheads across the Dnieper as the liberation of Ukraine rolls on. Even in Italy, territory was liberated. In that case, Naples was liberated from German occupation. That does not mean, though, that things are going smoothly there. The liberation of Naples grew sanguinary again at 2.10 p.m. on Thursday, October 7th, when the first German time bomb exploded in the southwest corner of the main post office on Via Monte Oliveto. The first two floors were blown completely away, a witness reported. Chunks of steel and marble were thrown as far as 100 yards. The blast ripped apart an army work detail and Neapolitans begging for food along a mess line. 70 people are killed or wounded. Two days from now on the 10th, a similar blast in the Corso Orientale will kill 23 combat engineers. In fact, such bombs will continue to explode all month. Sappers will search hundreds of buildings and will disarm explosives in 17 of them. This campaign greatly increases local hatred of Germans. Though, as Atkinson also points out, Allied planes drop thousands of bombs with delay fuses. There will be a pretty big voluntary evacuation of the city late in October, just before the power grid is turned on again. People worried about sabotage, but there will be none. Drinkable water will flow in city pipes from the 13th. This week on the 2nd, the reconstruction of roads and railways begins, and engineers take soundings in the harbor. I mentioned last week that Rodolfo Graziani is now Minister of War for Benito Mussolini's puppet regime in Italy. The only purposeful project of the neo-fascist government was the creation of a new army. On the 3rd, Graziani presents a plan for such a project to Mussolini, who accepts it and writes to Adolf Hitler that Graziani will visit him and that they will completely collaborate with German high command while putting together their new army. In the field in Italy this week, the U.S. 6th Corps takes Benevento on the 2nd. On the 5th, the forward units of 10th Corps reach the Volturno River. The next day, Caserta and Capua fall, and 5th Army reaches the Volturno en masse the 7th and 8th. An attack across it is planned for the 12th. On the east coast, advance units of the 78th Division cross the Biferno II and commandos land near Termoli and take the town. The Germans send the 16th Panzers to fight this, though, and the fighting lasts until the 7th, when the Panzers will pull back behind the Trigno River. 8th Army Commander Bernard Montgomery does not feel he has the strength to follow them at the moment. Today, though, 8th Army takes Larino and Guglionesi inland from Termoli. As for the fighting in the islands, well, Rhodes surrendered to the Germans back on September 11th. And British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was determined not to lose Kos as well, figuring that would help knock the Allies out of the Aegean. Kos has a good aerodrome, and he's fixed October 23rd as the day to retake Rhodes from there. Now on the 3rd, though, the Germans preempt this at dawn by landing troops on Kos after a strong preliminary bombardment. There was a mix-up between the British and the Italian defenders. A British convoy carrying reinforcements was due at the same time, and the Italian coast batteries, who might have inflicted severe damage on the German ships, did not open fire at the time, thinking the ships were British, while most of the Italian defending troops on the coast stayed too long in the air raid shelters. Simultaneously with the landing from the sea, German parachutists dropped from the sky, while the British and Italian positions were subjected to continuous heavy attack 
from German bombers and fighter aircraft. So the Allies can't use the Kos Aerodrome to send up any planes, and the ones in Libya and Cyprus are well over 300 kilometers away. By the end of the 4th, the Germans have taken Kos. British soldiers are taken away as POWs, but the Italians are seen by the Germans as traitors. 87 Italian officers are shot upon surrender. Later in the week, on the 7th, two British cruisers and two destroyers do intercept a German convoy heading for Kos and sink seven transports and an escort. On the 4th, Corsica is fully liberated by the Free French. And the Soviet liberation of the Kuban is coming to its close. The German 49th Mountain Corps pulls back from the Vienna Stellung to the even shorter Bucharest Stellung the night of the 2nd. On the 5th, they pull back to the Berlin Stellung, just 16 kilometers wide. That night, the final Romanian troops are evacuated. The 6th, the Axis pull their headquarters back to Ilyich on the Kerch Strait, and two infantry divisions cross to Crimea. The 7th and 8th see the last rearguard actions by the Axis and those men pull into a perimeter around Ilyich tonight. At 1 a.m. tonight, the last unit will leave. And tomorrow, the Soviets have liberated the Kuban. But there's also tons of territory to the northwest the Germans are trying to hold onto. From Dnipropetrovsk, the Dnieper curves south for like 70 kilometers, running to Zaporozhye before curving to the southwest and heading for the Black Sea coast at Kherson. That is a big bulge. The German plan is to hold bridgeheads at Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporozhye, and then the front would run south to Melitopol to protect the land bridge to Crimea. It is six army that is to remain east of the river down there to hold the line to Melitopol. First Panzer Army is to hold the bridgehead at Zaporozhye, and Hitler orders that specific bridgehead to be defended to the very last man. Hitler's justification for holding onto a bridgehead at Zaporozhye was the presence of powerful German units on the east bank of the Dnieper would act as a strong disincentive to the Red Army if it were to try to drive back German forces further south with the intention of isolating the Crimea. If such an operation was attempted, the bridgehead could be used as the start point of a powerful counterattack into the northern flank of the Soviet advance. This does make sense, provided there's enough force at that bridgehead. But if that force is achieved by weakening other sectors on the river, the Soviets could try to isolate it by crossing the river in force to the north, then destroy it at leisure. There is actually a fair amount of German force at Zaporozhye. Seven infantry divisions, a panzer, and a panzer grenadier division. But the industry in this industrial city is barely functional at this point, and it would not hurt Germany's war effort to abandon it. Also, when the Soviets retreated from it in 1941, they'd done damage to the turbines of the big hydroelectric dam there, and only limited capacity has been restored since then. Siegfried Heinrichi, commanding the German force here, does not plan to sacrifice his men because Hitler won't abandon the place. So he makes plans to blow the dam to cover a withdrawal. At the end of last week, on the 1st, the Soviets made major attacks on the Zaporozhye bridgehead, but attacks that day and the 2nd saw any gains retaken by the Germans. Heinrichi now sees no justification for him holding here. He can no longer be a concentration point for forces that would attack to the south. That ship has sailed. The losses suffered by all the German units in the bridgehead, combined with casualties sustained during the retreat towards the Dnieper, ensure that it was only a matter of time before it was impossible to restore the front line with counterattacks. And the lack of any tactical, operational, or strategic justification for the bridgehead was becoming increasingly clear to all. However, there remained the difficult issue of Hitler's insistence that the bridgehead be held at all costs. Heinrichi had no option but to allow matters to develop further. But there are a few days of relative calm around the Zaporozhye bridgehead after the second. Ivan Konyev meets with his step front commanders to make plans. They decide Vasily Chuikov's 8th Guards Army will lead the next attack. Stavka says they must eliminate the bridgehead by October 15th. But while Chuikov prepares things, there will be small attacks to try to draw off the mobile German armored reserves, like an attack today by 12th Army. 
they will tie down the Panzer Grenadiers into defending a chunk of the line. This is what Konyev wants. The possibility that the Zaporozhye bridgehead would be outflanked is already becoming more likely as well. Soviet 37th Army has two bridgeheads further north near Mishurin Rog. If they can consolidate, they can thrust toward Krivoy Rog. So really, the situation is that it's vital for the Germans to destroy those bridgeheads and vital for the Red Army to reinforce and enlarge them. There is heavy fighting for Borodayevka the second and third, but neither side can make much headway. The Gross Deutschland division is deployed on the hills from Ivashki, but they mainly just shore up the lines. They do make an attempt today, the eighth, to hit the bridgehead from the south with infantry supported by Tiger tanks. But the Tigers get ahead of the infantry and Soviet troops that allowed the Tigers to pass attack them from the rear and destroy them all, bringing Gross Deutschland's tank strength to zero. Just north of Kiev, units of the Soviet 38th Army have been trickling in and trying to cross and make a bridgehead there, and on the second, they finally succeed, taking Lyutej. They expand their bridgehead there and manage to get some armor across the fifth. A few days from now, even under constant artillery fire, the 5th Guard's tank corps will have all managed to cross and reinforce. They are soon to attack. And on the 6th, attacks by Andrei Yeremenko's Kalinin Front, which is soon to be named the 1st Baltic Front, hit the enemy at the junction of army groups north and center, liberating Nevel that day and creating a salient into enemy lines by the end of the week. This operation will be covered in more depth on our Instagram Day by Day series, which is also under the Community tab right here. It is not just in Italy and the Soviet Union where the Allies are on the move, either. On New Guinea on the 4th, Australian troops take Dumpu, heading from the Markham Valley into the Ramu Valley. And in the Solomons on the 6th comes the naval battle of Vela La Vela. This is really the end of Phase 2 of Operation Cartwheel. Matsuji Ijuin has a covering force of six destroyers protecting a transport group of three more and some smaller ships to evacuate their remaining men on Vela La Vela. They're spotted leaving Rabaul though, so six US destroyers are sent to intercept them. But only three do. At 10.31 PM, the Americans make radar contact, and just after that, the Japanese spot them. The Americans manage to get 14 torpedoes in the water and all three ships target Yugumo, the lead Japanese ship with their guns. She's hit and loses power, but one of her torpedoes brings a US destroyer to a standstill. More torpedoes from the other Japanese ships blow the bow off another American destroyer, and the third one runs into the crippled second one. The Japanese do not take advantage of the US ship's total disarray though. For minutes later, they spot the second group of three destroyers and they make tracks. All 590 men are successfully rescued from Vela La Vela. Each side loses one destroyer, and the US has another one badly damaged. And further across the Pacific, on the 7th, the Japanese execute 98 American civilians on Wake Island. Okay, when Japan took Wake in December 1941, there were around 500 civilians on the island, mostly construction workers. By now, most of these, and all military personnel have been sent to POW camps. On the 5th, planes from Allied Task Force 14 heavily bomb Wake. That force is six carriers, seven cruisers, and 25 destroyers strong, and the planes fly 738 sorties. So Japanese commander Shigematsu Sakaibara orders the execution of all those civilians by machine gun and rifle, worried about an invasion and that they would rise up and help the invaders. The victims have been blindfolded and stand by a tank ditch they have dug, so their bodies are tossed in the ditch and covered with sand. One man escapes the carnage, though. The bodies are even actually recounted to confirm it. He will be on the lam for three weeks before they catch him. Sakai Bara will personally behead him. He has, though, carved an epitaph to the rest of the dead on a rock with coral, which reads, 98 US PW, 10-5-43. There are many notes from the seas this week, actually. The Soviet Black Sea Fleet sends out ships to shell positions in Crimea to soften them up as a prelude to an amphibious assault with the troops coming over from Taman. On the 6th, three Soviet destroyers bombard Feodosia and Yalta, 
but they are spotted by the Luftwaffe and Stukas are sent out after them. A first attack savages one, a second another, and a third raid comes when the third destroyer is towing the other two and all three are sunk. Stalin issues orders that no warships of this size or larger are to be used without his express approval. On the 4th, German shipping off Bodo, Norway is attacked by planes from the US carrier Ranger, which is working with the British home fleet and has battleship support. They sink 4 freighters and damage 7 more. Speaking of the Royal Navy, Dudley Pound resigns that same day as first Sea Lord because of health issues. He will die the 21st. Andrew Cunningham will take over after Bruce Fraser turns down the job. John Cunningham will take over from Andrew command of the naval forces in the Mediterranean. And that brings me to the end of the week. With sabotage in Naples, mass murder on Wake, the liberation of the Kuban now a fact, and heavy fighting for the crossings of the Dnieper that are of vital importance to both sides. But if the Germans do manage to fight off the Soviets at the crossings, then what? They've now left the Caucasus completely, lost territorial gains that took a couple years to get in the first place, and lost hundreds of thousands of their best troops. What happens if they do fight off the Soviets and remain at the Dnieper crossings? Just, just stay there forever? As the Soviet advantage in men and production grows larger and larger? How is that an option? What is the long-term picture? Huh? What? No, no, no. Not the long-term picture in 1941. Huh? No, 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 no. Not the long-term picture from 1942. What is it now? Hello? Hello? Hmm. That's interesting. Your silence speaks volumes. As does your support, since it is you, the Time Ghost Army, that finances this series. Join the army to join this adventure at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Brett Ferugia is the army member of the week, and these are the newest army officers. And speaking of Soviet production, we did a special about rebuilding the Red Army a while back, and you can check that out right here. And you can also subscribe. And see you next time.